Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Office of the Chief Scientist uh, Science Seminar Series. Uh, I'm Andrew Paul, and I'm a Senior Science Advisor with the Office of the Chief Scientist, and am your host for this year's Winter Seminar Series. Uh, this will be our third seminar of the year. Uh, and I'd like to start just acknowledging that today we're on the traditional lands of treaties 4, 6, 7, 8, and 10, as well as the homeland of the Métis. Uh, this includes territory of the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota, Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, and Soto nations. Uh, so wherever you are, please recognize and acknowledge the relationship that First Nations, Inui, and Métis have where you live. Uh, we will be recording today's seminars. Um, recordings from previous seminars are available on Alberta Environment and Protected Areas YouTube page, uh, and the new recording, uh, today's recording, will be posted there um, fairly quickly um, uh, uh, in uh, in the next day or two. Uh, so, if yeah, if any of your colleagues are unable to make today's presentation, please um, let them know about that YouTube page uh, to help maintain quality today. Uh, Video and audio has been disabled. Um, uh, you can enter your questions in the comments uh, uh, box at any time during the presentation. I'll wait until the end of the presentation, Dr. Weinbrook, to, to read those questions out, um, and we'll do that in, in the order they're, they're received. Uh, so yeah, today it's a, it is a real pleasure to welcome Dr. Rolf Weinbrook from the University of Alberta. Uh, Dr. Weinbrook and I have worked on many of the same lakes over the past 30 years, but strangely, we have never met either virtually or in person before uh, uh, today's date or before this seminar. Uh, today, Dr. Weinbrook will be presenting on tracking spatial and temporal dynamics of cyanobacterial blooms in Pigeon Lake, Alberta, using Sentinel-2 satellite imagery. Uh, Dr. Weinbrook is a professor in the Department of Biological Sciences at the University of Alberta. He holds a Bachelor of Fine Arts from the University of Winnipeg, a Master's of Science in Botany from the University of Toronto, and a PhD in Aquatic Ecology from the University of Regina. He's been a full professor at the U of A since 2003, where his research focus uh, has been on the cumulative impacts of multiple environmental stressors on biodiversity and ecosystem functioning in mountain, boreal, and Arctic lakes. And with that, Dr. Weinbrook, I will turn it over to yourself. Okay, well, thank you for the introduction, Andrew, and also for the invitation to, to give this talk. Um, it's really kind of a great opportunity to kind of show what we've been up to for the past few years in terms of trying to get a, a better handle on the blue-green algal blooms that everybody hears about in the summer, though sometimes in the winter they're a little bit less on people's radars, but hopefully this will help inform people of what's what seems to be going on within the province. Um, so I'll just want to echo again, Andrew, that uh, acknowledgement here to the First Nations that most of the work that I'm going to be presenting today was conducted either in um, in the two Treaty 6 and also in tr to a certain extent in, in Treaty 8 as well. Uh, so just thanking the First Nations peoples for allowing us to explore the fresh waters. Um, this project involves a number of different partners, perhaps a little bit too numerous to try to mention all of them within the span of about approximately 30 minutes. But just to give you a very quick background history to this project, we initially started off with this idea, uh, working with, uh, with Jenny Graydon at Alberta Health Services, trying to get a better handle on how we could monitor cyanobacterial blooms in recreational waters across the province. And to a very large extent, this involved a lot of uh, uh, logistical help from the Lake Management Society and Bradley Peter in particular, with very, very strong involvement from certain lake groups like the Pigeon Lake groups and, and, and Robert Gibbs, uh, also from the uh, Lac Labiche and also from Wabaman Lake as well, not to mention only just a few. And then uh, more recently, we uh, teamed up with uh, geospatial scientists Fiona Gregory, uh, Jennifer Hurd and with Cynthia McLean at the ABMI, the Alberta Biodiversity Monitoring uh, Institute, and got funding from Alberta Innovates to further this project uh, to a number of different lakes to try to see how well we can actually come up with these sorts of uh, findings. And along the way, we've had a lot of involvement from Alberta Health, uh, Alberta government in the way of Alberta Environment Protected uh, Areas. We've also brought in some uh, federal 
expertise from Environment Canada in Burlington, and we also have some environmental consultant firms with associate engineering as well. So a number of different uh, partners involved in this project. Um, just to kind of give you a little bit of an idea of the structure of my talk and also the timeline of this project, it actually looked, started well back before 2023 with uh, working with Alberta Health Funding. But right now, what we're focusing on here is in the past year, last summer, we designated six lakes that I'll be talking a little bit more, more about, but I'll be mainly highlighting like the titles that uh, was suggested in the in the abstract that was posted for this talk. I'll be uh, mainly focusing on pitching to a large extent because that's where most of our progress to date has been achieved. But um, of those six lakes, uh, we've also got buoy displacement being uh, conducted so that we get in situ high frequency monitoring of water quality parameters from these lakes. So we can relate them then to the blue green algal blooms that are occurring within these lakes. And then I'll just show you a little bit about how we're gaining archival uh, data from past satellite images of these lakes to answer some of these history questions like how have cyanobacteria blooms in the province become worse over the past few years, or is it just that human perceptions become a little bit more sensitive? And then we'll be validating our models like you'll see today to see how well these satellite uh, images track cyanobacteria blooms from, uh, from space. We'll be repeating this next year as well to try to validate and further calibrate our models across these lakes to see how well they actually perform. And then eventually, um, we're aiming to have a forecasting model somewhat analogous to a weather forecast model that can tell people, uh, depending on the current conditions within particular lakes, what are what's the probability of a problematic harmful algal bloom occurring within the lake in the near future. And this will all be also be made uh, accessed publicly available by way of a development of a, a web application that's being created right now through Alberta uh, ABMI as well. So like I mentioned, this project, first of all, started off with just a few lakes with a primary focus on Pigeon Lake, but now with further funding, we've expanded this to six of these lakes. You can see them here all. Um, and they were selected by way of consultation with Alberta Environment, also with with the uh, Alberta Lake Management Society to try to capture the range of different extents to which lakes within central Alberta have experienced um, cyanobacterial or blue-green algal blooms in the past. And also to get an idea of, do these models that we're going to be showing you today vary as a function of how productive an individual lake is. Extreme cases here, something like Sylvan Lake there on the bottom right, relatively very, very infrequent sorts of problems with algal blooms. Um, other lakes like perhaps Lac La Biche, um, it's much more sort of like an annual or almost regular semi-annual sort of event. Um, so one of the reasons was what's the motivation for reverting to satellite imaging of these lakes when um, we probably perhaps have one of the most extensive lake monitoring programs of any province within Canada and traditional means have been used for quite a while to, to monitor these lakes. Well, I think my colleagues at Alberta Environment and uh, Lake Watch at, at Alms would probably uh, agree with me that it's, it's difficult to try to logistically sample all of these different types of lakes on a very, very regular high frequency basis. And when you get to the lake, there's only so and so much time you have to spend sampling a lake so that you have a lot of kind of logistical constraints over how well you can in a relatively short period of time and cost effectively monitor an entire lake for algal blooms, particularly given like this animation shows from Pigeon Lake taken during the year open water season of 2018, that the variability of a cyanobacterial or a brutal clean algal bloom that occurs across the lake, as you can see by this wisp, is very, very dynamic. From, from day to day and also depending on where you are within a particular spot within the lake. You might be in a part of the lake sampling where it seems to be not very abundant with cyanobacteria, but if you're in one of these wisps or clouds, you probably get a very, very different sort of impression. The interesting thing about satellite monitoring like you'll see today is that from these images, we can collectively uh, get a 
complete representative picture of the extent to which the cyanobacteria blooms are affecting a particular lake at a particular point in time. And that is often done on a very, very sort of regular basis when I talk about the satellites that we're accessing. So here's just an example from last summer of the six study lakes about how variable both over time and also within the lake on each one of the sampling dates chlorophyll values are. And here I'll stay right for those of you that aren't that familiar with, you know, what's 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 it about chlorophyll. Chlorophyll is a regularly used sort of surrogate measure for the amount of biomass of phytoplankton or algae floating within a lake. And in many cases, um, chlorophyll A is used because it's a much more expedient sort of way of measuring total phytoplankton or algal biomass rather than trying to do much more laborious measurements involving light microscopy. So here you can kind of see the abundance, inferred abundance of phytoplankton is highly variable both across time and both across space, sometimes or varying by over a full order of magnitude in some cases. So unless you're out there all the time um, measuring these sorts of parameters like chlorophyll, um, spot samples will not always give you the complete picture of the extent to which a lake might be having a particular problem. So that was the motivation behind why should we start thinking about using uh, Earth Observatory satellites. So it kind of came to our attention, like probably back in about 2019 or, or perhaps even a little bit earlier, that uh, the European Space Agency, the Copernicus program, had launched a couple or maybe a few different satellites under the names of Sentinel-2 and Sentinel-3. And they were specifically designed to be uh, monitoring surface waters for reflectance of different types of uh, wavelengths of sunlight that were then attributable to differences in water quality uh, pertaining directly to, in some cases, whether or not a lake had a particular high abundance of cyanobacteria or phytoplankton. And this is all really a very, very kind of sort of cost-effective measures, whereas the, the satellites are always at, already in place, put out through the European Space Agency, and all of the imagery data that is logged, um, particularly over Alberta on a probably approximately about a five day revisit frequency, so quite quite frequent, is all available uh, freely through the Google Earth engine, which hosts the data and provides it to anyone who's interested in using it. So first of all, what is it that these satellites are in fact detecting in their imagery? Uh, when, when phytoplankton or algae or blue-green algae in particular, uh, produce uh, cells, they are containing vast amounts of chlorophyll. And in particular, all of these different groups that I just mentioned, all produce chlorophyll A. And here you can kind of see the absorption spectrum of what a pigment like chlorophyll A looks like in terms of which wavelengths it absorbs of sunlight. So you have to kind of imagine the inverse of this because this is absorption shown right here. But what the satellites are actually measuring is the amount of reflectance of different wavelengths of light that are returning back into the uh, out, into outer space. And in particular here, um, the wavelengths that are used to measure and detect chlorophyll A are usually in the high six to seven, low 700s or in the red to infrared spectral level there on the far right, because that's where the most steep change in absorption or reflectance occurs with uh, the context of chlorophyll A. And also it's relatively free of attenuation by any kind of interference from the atmosphere itself. So it's a relatively pure, unconfounded sort of signal of how much chlorophyll is within a lake. Um, so with that, the idea was here to um, coordinate uh, when the satellites were passing over the six different study lakes with ground crews that would then go out onto the lakes and sample the lakes for chlorophyll as the satellite was going over measuring these reflectance wavelength bands, and then to see if we could calibrate a model of how well did the satellite images predict the actual chlorophyll concentrations across these six different lakes as shown right here. And so to do this ground truthing exercise, which again, uh, um, 
I, I will salute the efforts of Bradley Peters at, at Lake Watch and also uh, Ron Surwell and Craig uh, Emerton at Alberta Environment and Protected Areas and all the other lake groups that are involved in these six different lakes, that this is a campaign that's not trivial. It has to be very, very well coordinated with the passage of the satellites on a particular given day, sometimes usually somewhere in the early afternoon. They have to be relatively cloudless free days. Um, and to do the ground truthing uh, reliably or accurately, um, they need to sample from a multitude of different points across the lake as the satellite's passing over. And then each one of these sample points are coordinated with GPS uh, with, to correspond with the satellite image that was taken of that particular point within the lake. So for example, here, Pigeon Lake, typically when this exercise is being uh, conducted, is sampled from about 30 different points along a grid work as shown here in this particular figure. So then when the water samples are collected, um, they're sent back to our lab at the University of Alberta, where, uh, People like Jenna Cook uh, does the analyses of the chlorophyll concentrations captured within the water samples and also the other different types of uh, non-chlorophyll products that are consistent. You can kind of consider them to be carotenoids produced by, by algae. And a number of those carotenoids, like I'll show in a second, are very, very taxonomically specific and diagnostic to cyanobacteria, which is very, very helpful because to just step back a second, all phytoplankton, all algae produce chlorophyll A. So if that's the only thing you're measuring, the question remains, is the chlorophyll that's being produced within a lake attributable to a cyanobacterial or a blue-green algal bloom, or is it perhaps attributable to some other uh, benign sort of group of algae? So the high-performance liquid chromatography device shown right here gives us the information to determine whether or not a particular algal bloom is actually of a cyanobacterial nature. Um, another important thing here is in some cases, the, the pigment data is perhaps a little bit coarse. And so we also have the operation of uh, an advanced digitalized flow cytometer known uh, commercially as a flow cam that does uh, semi to uh, semi-automated um, um, calculations and quantifications of the number of cyanobacterial cells within a water sample as well, um, with having, how, having to go through the, like I mentioned already earlier, the laborious time-consuming efforts of using uh, light microscopy. So to do a uh, hyperferential liquid chromatography uh, analyses, it's shown right here, it's a multi-stage sort of process over on the top right panel right here that I won't go through each one of the particular steps, but ultimately what happens is that a sample that is um, filtered and then concentrated for all the phytoplankton cells within it, the pigments from that sample are extracted. It's run through one of these HPLCs and the different pigments are separated by differences in their polarity and you get different types of pigments then quantified by way of they each have a very unique spectral sort of fingerprint as shown down there on the bottom right hand corner of the top panel there. And interesting also the, the figure at the bottom here at the very bottom right shows you the difference in how the different types of algal pigments or phytoplankton pigments just differ inherently in their coloration. Uh, certain cyanobacterial pigments are produced that are very, very taxonomically unique to only them. So you know that they are the uh, they are the players in some lakes, whereas in some other cases, other types of algae, like the more brownish ones on the far left there, are other types of algae that people generally don't have any kind of like issue with in terms of of health risks. Here's also a uh, the product from a flow cam device, a sample of water from collected from a lake is passed through the flow cam instrument. And that instrument has, I think, approximately about 25 different types of detectors that scan that water sample as it's flowing through for any kinds of particles and then measures it in all kinds of different ways, including it gives you a photographic account that automatically builds up on the screen as the sample uh, on the computer screen as the sample is running and you can kind of see it here. And those samples can be sorted and identified. So to tell you whether or not you have particular cyanobacterial species of concern that are known toxin producers, whereas other cyanobacteria 
um, can also be considered relatively benign and not really a threat to uh, human or animal health. So here is an example of how well the chlorophyll concentrations in Pigeon Lake back, I believe, in 2020 there on the x-axis corresponded with the number of blue-green algal cells or cyanobacterial cells within that corresponding sample of water. You can see here that the relationship is a little bit noisy, but there is a positive uh, correlation. Uh, so chlorophyll A here is a relatively good predictor of cyanobacterial cell counts. Um, and then this is an important point I just want to make out right here. Um, in the satellite models that I'm going to be showing in the next few slides, uh, we define an algal bloom as being one that has reached a threshold of about 30 micrograms of chlorophyll per liter. And from this figure right here, that kind of corresponds to about 36,000 cyanobacterial cells per mil, which is well below the World Health Organization for posting uh, uh, a recreational health advisory, which is typically more around the area of about 100,000 cells per mil. But this just gives you an idea of, in the models that I'll be showing you, when we say there was a bloom in a particular lake, that it exceeded this threshold of 30 micrograms per liter. And that's something, like I'll mention in the next little while, is differs between depending on which particular lakes uh, are actually be looked at in this way. So um, this gets back to a thing that I just mentioned a couple of slides ago. Um, you can detect chlorophyll from outer space with a satellite. The question remains, however, is the chlorophyll that it's detecting attributable to cyanobacteria or some other algal group? Um, this shows you, uh, again, from Pigeon Lake, that the amount of chlorophyll detected um, on the x-axis is a pretty strong predictor and indicator of uh, cyanobacteria in this particular lake's case. In particular, there's two types of uh, diagnostic cyanobacterial pigments here plotted on the vertical y-axis. The top panel shows a pigment known as canthoxanthin. Canthoxanthin is a pigment that's produced specifically by different types of blue-green algae that are very, very filamentous or string-like. You might see the photograph up there on the very top left, the, the ones that kind of look like somebody's from grass clippings into your lake, that's a filamentous cyanobacterium. Um, at the bottom on the y-axis, there's another pigment known as mixoxanthophyll. It also correlates very strongly with chlorophyll A um, in Pigeon Lake. And mixoxanthophyll is much more indicative of different groups of potentially toxic cyanobacteria that are form colonies or more clusters, like the image is shown right down there at the bottom. You might have heard of the toxin microcystis that uh, photograph down there at the bottom that produces mixoxanthophyll. That's the genus Microcystis. And that particular uh, genus, if you see it occurring within a lake, looks much more like somebody threw some dried uh, uh, art, artist paint pigment powder into the lake and it kind of floats around looking like a, like a, like a floating residue. So two very different types of cyanobacterial groups, uh, both of concern. Um, very strongly correlated with chlorophyll concentrations in this particular case. So um, how well the, did the satellite, in particular the Sentinel-2 Sentinel satellite that we use that has a pixel resolution that ranges from about 10 to about 20 meters in size, um, the index that we use based off of the data from the Sentinel-2 is shown down on the x-axis. It's known as a three-band index. It's three different bands of in infrared that are used to detect chlorophyll reflectance. And there you can see, so the satellite imagery data is on the x-axis, the amount of chlorophyll that was actually detected um, then in Pigeon Lake across those different samples during that summer uh, as analyzed and the lab is shown on the y-axis. And you see here that the relationship is actually pretty good with the best fit line explaining about 89% of the variance in that relationship. So, so not a bad, if you want to call it algorithm or model for inferring chlorophyll concentrations without having to measure it in the lake and just using it from satellite-based imagery. Um, an interesting point is that we found subsequently, um, and this is a lot of the work of Fiona Gregory, is that 
the algorithm or model for Pigeon Lake, as shown down there in the blue on this graph right there, um, varies in its parameters from uh, the same models that we developed by way of the same sort of exercise on other lakes. In particular, um, you can see Wobbleman down there on the bottom left. Uh, Lac La Biche is sampled there in the green. Lesser Slave Lake is shown in the yellow. And then collectively, those four different lake models are all put together to kind of like produce our master algorithm for inferring chlorophyll in Albertan lakes to this point using satellite data. So an interesting thing here, which we're trying to further explore, is why do these actually, these models vary across lakes? Um, probably the most basic sort of uh, explanation is that they differ in the extent to which um, they contain chlorophyll or produce chlorophyll. You can see Pigeon Lake has much more variance in in their its data than say says does Wobbleman. There's also the issues of differences in inherent water color. Some lakes are a little bit more browner than others. Also, they differ in terms of what kind of blue-green algae are actually in the different lakes. Some blue-green algae produce a lot of chlorophyll. Some of them do not. And that could also have some influence here on, um, on how these models actually work out. Um, so the, the next idea, which I can't really show you yet because we're not yet in the summer of 2024, but it's coming up, is to use these different models that we've built based off the ground truthing exercise, and then to see how well they actually hold up across years. So this is like our, our next sort of validation step to see how robust these models that we developed previously, how well they stand up to interannual uh, variation. And it's kind of important to note because we've already seen that the, the the models or the algorithms vary across space in terms of across lakes. Now the question is, do they also vary within a lake across years? And like you would hopefully think not, but we have yet the jury's out on to whether or not they are uh, robust across years. Um, but one I, thing I wanna really show you really quickly here is that we're using these models to go back in time to uh, look at how the history of some of these lakes have been in terms of the severity of the cyanobacterial blooms that have occurred in them. And we took this out of the page of some of the federal uh, Environment Canada scientists that were doing this sort of idea on some major lakes in Canada, but we were the first, or we've been the first to actually do this on small lakes uh, compared to what they've been doing. They've been working on Lake Winnipeg, Lake of the Woods, Lake Erie, um, using the same sort of approach. They use a 10 microgram chlorophyll per liter threshold rather than our us, we are using 30, because in general, their lakes are inherently a little bit less productive than are the lakes in central Alberta, particularly in the case of Lake of the Woods that's on a boreal landscape. Um, but we're using some of their metrics to actually look at how some bacterial blooms have varied in their characteristics over the last few years. And here again, we use Pigeon Lake as a real good model. Um, based off of the algorithm that we developed for the 2020 data, we have used all of the Sentinel data that is available dating back to 2017. And we've looked at the top panel here, which is the intensity of the bloom um, in terms of like how concentrated were the chlorophyll concentrations across the different points. Um, and there you can kind of see the intensity has not really shown any kind of like significant trend over those few years. The bottom, the middle panel, panel B, shows you the extent or spatial spread of the blooms. You can get a bloom that's very, very localized in the lakes, such as occurred in 2018 and 2019. And other lakes, you can have blooms that extend almost across the entire expanse of the lake. And it's the product of the intensity, how concentrated were the blooms in particular spots, times the area, uh, how far spread were they in the lake, that gives you the bottom panel, which is the severity. And you can see then again from 2017 to 23, there hasn't really been over that short span of a few years any kind of significant trend to say it's getting worse or it's getting better. It's just highly variable across years and also across seasons. Here it just kind of shows you the different things we can actually measure. 
Um, an interesting point here at the top is how long do the blooms actually exist within Pigeon Lake? Again, from 2070 to 22, no real clear pattern. Uh, intensity shown there at the bottom panel there is again lots of spatial variation like I already mentioned but there isn't really any kind of a consistent trend over time an interesting thing here is that if you put all of that data over the last several years together and you produce a composite um, it's very interesting to see that the cyanobacteria blooms earlier in the summer at the beginning of August seem to concentrate more along the northwestern uh, basin part of the basin and then before it's spreading out by way of wind and wave action throughout the rest of the lake by the start of fall and finally what we're trying to do now is to relate these variations in cyanobacteria blooms within these lakes to in situ high frequency measurements of different types of water quality uh, parameters to develop uh, a model for predicting when these might actually occur in the future and then finally, like I mentioned from the outset, uh, this will all ultimately become available to the public by way of a web-based app where people can actually click into these things and look either back in time or uh, look into the future to see whether or not a cyanobacterial bloom is imminent um, should they show, be visiting a lake in the near future. So I think that was about 30 minutes. Um, so just to kind of reiterate some key points along the way, um, uh, one thing is that, like I mentioned earlier or alluded to this, the satellite approach to monitoring cyanobacterial blooms is a relative, once the satellites up there, um, it's a relatively cost effective method for users such as us to, uh, to track cyanobacterial blooms here in the province as has already been started in some other places as well in North America. Um, and it really does offer a much more high frequency, high resolution uh, means of data than in many cases sometimes um, possible to achieve with like, you know, doing it by way of uh, traditional methods. The other one is um, before we get too excited about that, we really have to first of all, make sure that these models um, are soundly ground truth to make sure that the reliable and again, like I said, the jury's out as to how much variation or how much adjustment has to be made to these algorithms. The, the best thing would be to say if we could ultimately have a master algorithm that, you know, within reason is, is applicable to a wide variety of lakes within the province beyond the ones that we're using here in our study lakes. Um, and then lastly, um, Ultimately, if we actually have these robust uh, algorithms in place, then corresponding the data coming from them with environmental manage, uh, environmental me uh, uh, measurements, both in situ within the lake and also regional data, particularly related to climactic variables, are what we're ultimate goal is for developing uh, a procedure for both asking that long question that have blue green algal blooms gotten worse in the province and whether we can actually predict what they're going to be like in the imminent future and that's that's really kind of our ultimate goal so with that um i would be happy to take on any sorts of questions uh excellent uh, th thanks dr Weinbrook. we are running out of uh, time now um, if there are any more questions that come in, we'll be sure to share those uh, with yourself, Dr. Vinebrook, and I'm going to offer that people can reach out to yourself if they uh, want to oh, follow yeah. up on certain, certain things. Anytime. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, also, um, <clears throat> want to remind people our next seminar is uh, Tuesday, March 12th. Uh, we'll be hosting Dr. Barry Robinson from the Canadian Wildlife Service. Uh, and he'll be presenting on species density models to inform conservation of grassland birds throughout the Great Plains. Uh, just a quick reminder, if folks want to be on the mailing list for these science seminars, please send an email to the Office of the Chief Scientist mailbox, which is ap.ocs, and that's at gov.ab.ca. Uh, um, so with that, again, um, thank you, Dr. Vinebrook, for a wonderful presentation and taking the time to answer all the questions that, that came in today. It's much appreciated. Yeah, great set of questions. Yeah, it really was. Thank you so much. Hey.